You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. We're going to be talking tonight about what we found on our trip to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Driving across the desert of Nevada, approaching from the Boulder City Highway, looming off in the distance is an incredible sight. If you did not absolutely know where you were at, you would tend to believe that you were delirious and had somehow been transported to the desert of Egypt. Rising up above the city of Las Vegas is a black, reflecting, huge pyramid, easily as big as the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt. On the top of this pyramid is a crystal capstone, or what appears or looks like crystal capstone, reflecting the sunlight in every direction. If you've ever looked at a polished piece of black obsidian volcanic glass, that might give you some idea of what the surface of this pyramid looks like. As you travel closer along the highway, you begin to see looming up in front of the pyramid an exact replica of the Sphinx. And in front of the Sphinx, towering approximately 150 feet in the air, the phallus of Osiris, an obelisk for those of you who have not followed our series on the mysteries. And if you don't know what an obelisk is, I'm sure you're acquainted with the Washington Monument. The site is absolutely awe-inspiring. The sheer size of this structure is overwhelming. It covers an area so large that driving around it, one begins to wonder how in the world this could have ever been built, much less built in the short period of time that it was, in fact, assembled. During the time that the Luxor Hotel was under construction, a huge fence surrounded the area. They had armed guards on patrol. No one was allowed to watch the construction or see what was going on, except that part which loomed above the fence. No visitors were allowed to watch the construction, and no press was given access. When we first drove to the Luxor, went around this huge, tremendous complex upon which this hotel sits, and then finally went across the street, parked the car, put our press passes on the front of our garments, got out with our video cameras. I looked directly across the street and was confronted with the head of Tutankhamun, who then promptly winked at me. Everything about this ninth wonder of the world or it truly is, I can assure you, leaves one with a sense of awe, a sense of disbelief, overwhelming beauty. It is, in fact, beautiful, beyond description. What I'm trying to do here is convey to you what I saw, and there are not words enough to do it. Now, if you've listened to our series on Mystery Babylon, you know that the Egyptian pyramids were never tombs. They were not burial places or crypts for the bodies of kings or queens or anyone else. They were temples, great temples of the mystery religion, and they functioned for the purpose of initiation. I can assure you that the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas is a temple of initiation for the masses, the millions upon millions of people who visit that city each year, probably billions not just from America, but primarily from America, but also from around the world. For every single bit of symbolism connected with the mysteries is built into this hotel, beginning with the obelisk, which represents the generative force, the sphinx, which is to remind mankind that he is, after all, only an animal, you can think, and therefore is always engaged in this constant battle between the animal and the intellect, and then the great temple of initiation, the pyramid, this one with capstone intact, crystalline in nature, representing as the sun reflects and glints off of every faceted side of it, representing the all-seeing eye. To give you some idea of the size of this structure, Inside the building on the ground floor, 
Nine Boeing 747s would fit comfortably with no crowding and no problem. Nine Boeing 747, and those are the huge passenger jets. Nine. Inside the building there is an obelisk which begins at the lowest floor, which is below the ground floor actually. Begins on the lowest floor, comes up through the casino, onto the upper deck, and points directly at the center apex, the zenith of the pyramid, is another obelisk. It is an incredible sight, ladies and gentlemen. Everywhere you go, there are Egyptian hieroglyphics, scenes of all of the ancient gods. Remember I told you all the old gods are returning? Boy, are they ever. The whole story of the Osirian cycle is unfolded. The Nile River is there, and in fact, the Nile River circumnavigates the entire lower level, and they have great Egyptian barges upon which people ride around the outside, inside perimeter of this great pyramid. The rooms are all built into the outer walls. There are no rooms inside the walls. They are in the walls of the pyramid, and each floor is on a level that juts out above the floor below it all the way up. The elevators are inclinators, and they travel up to the different floors. Four elevators are inclinators, one at each corner of the pyramid. The space inside this building is awesome. It's overwhelming. As you travel up the escalator and walk down the steps into what appears to be a city within a pyramid, in the midst of which is this huge obelisk pointing toward the apex above, lasers of different colors flash and cross the air in front and around and over you everywhere you go. There are lights and there are television sets every which way you turn, of every conceivable size, until you finally stand and you're looking up at the side of what appears to be a skyscraper inside this pyramid, on the side of which is a huge television screen, and it reminds you of George Orwell's 1984. That immediately comes to mind. For everywhere you look, there are eyes and television sets just as what was described in 1984, Oren Huxley's Brave New World. There is no doubt whatsoever that the people who built this resort hotel were not only well-versed in the mysteries, but were experts, are experts in the mysteries. They understood everything. There is a three-chapter episode consisting of three different rides or experiences, whatever you want to call it, called the search for the obelisk. And everywhere there are screens giving you little previews of these three different episodes or chapters. And you need three different places to go to experience this over a period of time. And they are urging you to come join the quest. If you read my book and if you've paid attention during the mystery series broadcast of the Hour of the Time, you know that at the heart and soul of all of what's happening in the world is the order of the quest. Benjamin Franklin talked about the order of the quest. He, in all actuality, was a member of the order of the quest. He was also a Freemason. He was also the Grand Master of the Lodge of Nine Muses, Thomas Jefferson, was a member of this Order of the Quest, as was George Washington and just about every one of our forefathers. Come join the quest. The quest. It's all about the discovery, 12,000 feet below the desert, of an ancient ruin, of an ancient civilization, where they find levitating craft. Does that sound familiar? Any connection here with UFOs? Any connection with Hitler's belief that the Aryan race represented 
the survivors of a lost civilization, far advanced beyond what we are now, and that in this ruin, also this rings of the tales of the inner earth, in this ruin they supposedly found a crystal obelisk, which was stolen, by the way, by a Dr. Osiris, who now holds the key to the future of the earth and mankind. And everywhere you look are these plaques or emblems of the Enlightened Society for Global Transformation. The Enlightened Society for Global Transformation. You can stop and get a burger and a Coke or a beer or whatever you want, in fact, at the Millennium Cafe. I found it at first to be difficult to understand what was going on around me and to, in fact, keep from bumping into people because everyone was so preoccupied with looking up or looking behind them that we were all constantly bumping into each other. Men, women, children, didn't matter. Temples, emblems of the snake were everywhere. Now, on that first day, I very wisely retreated to get my wits about me. I took a little bit of information with me, did not do any filming except from across the street. We filmed the whole outside of the hotel, nothing inside at that point, because, to tell you the truth, we were a little overwhelmed and didn't quite know where to start. I wondered how in the world this had come about. I found out through asking questions that the hotel and the grounds, the complex, the Sphinx, the obelisk, everything, had cost $400 million dollars. Paid for in cash, not one penny was taken out in loan to build this hotel. Now, if you ever had dreams of going to Las Vegas to win your fortune, I would suggest you take those dreams, put them in an iron box, lock them up, and throw them in the deepest river that you can find. For that $400 million, ladies and gentlemen, represents only the Luxor Hotel, and it came out of the pockets of all of the visitors to Las Vegas, who had visited these hotel casinos. The Circus Circus Hotel Casino, the Excalibur Hotel Casino, the Slots of Fun Casino and Silver City Casino, the Circus Circus Hotel Casino in Reno, Nevada, the Colorado Bell Hotel Casino in Laughlin, and the Edgewater Hotel Casino in Laughlin. For it is the group that owns this conglomerate of hotels that built the Luxor. And it became no surprise to me to find out that it was Circus Circus, which had also built the Excalibur Hotel. Now, if you listen to our series on the mysteries, you know that the Roman Circus was built to take the attention of the people away from the emperor, to give them the games to quench their thirst for blood and excitement, so that when they went home at night they were exhausted and didn't feel like rebelling. And it served the emperor well for hundreds of years. So they built the Circus Circus Hotel in Las Vegas. And then they built the Slots of Fun Casino, the Circus Circus Hotel Casino in Reno, the Colorado Bell Hotel Casino in Laughlin, the Edgewater Hotel Casino in Laughlin. And then they went back to their theme and built the Excalibur Hotel in Las Vegas, which I asked to do all about the legend of King Arthur and the search for the Holy Grail another quest. The Holy Grail in the Mysteries has nothing to do with the cup that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper. The Holy Grail in the Mysteries, in fact, represents the bloodline of the House of David. Those believed by the Mysteries to have the divine right to rule. I've said this many, many times before. I will say it again. Whoever rules the world in the New World Order, will they claim to the ancestry of the House of David? And then the Luxor, the ultimate temple of initiation that has ever been built throughout history. The shows that you go to in this hotel are beyond description, and you'll have to wait until you can get a chance to visit the Luxor, and I advise you all to do it. You will see verification in front of you everywhere you turn of everything that I've ever told you on this broadcast about the mystery religion of Babylon. It's all there. Nothing has been left out. As you go from show to show, you are indoctrinated slowly 
into the mysteries. You are told that if mankind does not change now, that the future will be bleak, if not non-existent, for mankind upon this earth. Everywhere you hear the phrase repeated, Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. The same phrase that kicked off the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution is now being heard in America. And the great quest, this search for the crystal obelisk in these shows, is really symbolically the search for God, for the obelisk represents the generative force, the force of creation that makes things happen, gets things done. And what you ultimately discover, and by the way, the discovery, as far as I could see, was only made by a few, is that there is no God, man is God. That's the theme, and that's what you learn if you're paying attention. Most people that I saw were completely baffled they had no idea what they were going through and couldn't even figure out the, the story. <laughs> and that was amazing. It's amazing, it's, it's entertaining, and it's very, very sad to watch sheeple trying to deal with this great esoteric religion that's all around them and not understanding one single piece of it. I saw it everywhere I went. People would come out of the first episode scratching their head and looking around and wondering what it was all about, what happened here, what, you know, it was a fun ride. And, and i got to tell you, folks, the ride on that first episode, well, I can't describe it. I will tell you this, you've never been on a ride like it in your life, I can guarantee you that. It is virtual reality. And by the way, they have a virtual land there where you can pilot an F-14 Tomcat if you want. And I mean, when it goes up, you go up. <laughs> if you do a flip, if it does a flip, you do a flip. And you're in that cockpit, and you take off, and you land, or you crash, or you, you go straight up and until you stall and fall back down to the earth. This is an incredible place. When I did the episode, when I explained to you the meaning of 2001, in that movie there was an obelisk, a monolith, a stone, black, remember, smooth, shiny, everything was reflected in it. And remember when the astronaut went out to investigate it, he couldn't find an opening and finally pulled up a piece of it, looked inside, and there was another universe. Well, I got news for you folks. That stone makes up on the inside a huge monolith, just like in the movie 2001, perfectly polished, as black as black could ever possibly be in your wildest, darkest nightmares. And it reflects everything that goes on. All of the lights and the laser beams that are flashing through the air are all reflected in this shiny, polished, smooth black stone. It resembles the stone in the meditation room of the United Nations. What you're hearing tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is the indoctrination of the masses, the sheeple, into the exoteric meaning, not the esoteric, mind you. Only those of us who have been studying that for many years really understand what we're looking at. But the public is being prepared for the new world religion. Make no mistake about that. And we all must prepare for what's coming, for what is coming for many of us, is not going to be good. Many people will embrace the New World Order and the New World Religion. They will not have to think anymore. They will not have to be responsible. Of course, they will have no freedoms, but Daddy will take care of them. Their every need will be furnished as long as they do what they're told, when they're told, how they're told, and worship the God that they're told to worship. Those people will be happy, but many of us will not be happy under those circumstances, and we need to prepare ourselves for the hardships and the trauma that is coming. And as sure as I'm speaking to you tonight, it is coming. A visit to the Luxor Hotel will bring this home to you quickly, quicker than anything that I can think of. And when you see the Excalibur right next door, and down the street, the Circus Circus, all built by the same people, and all right out of the control mechanism of the ancient mystery religions of Babylon. When you go down to the lower level, the murals of Egyptian life 
cover the entire walls of this stairwell, which also, by the way, has escalators. It goes down to the base of the obelisk, which goes up through several floors and then up into the center of this great pyramid and points directly to the apex. At one point I was watching the laser light show when all of a sudden a small port opened in the apex of the pyramid and a pure shaft of light connected with the tip of the obelisk. And a chill went right up my spine and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I felt this terrible fear in my belly knowing that these people are not playing games. I was even more taken aback when all those standing around who had witnessed this laughed and giggled and pointed and thought this was just another wonderful part of the entertainment, having no conception of what they were witnessing. Luxor, by the way, means the source of light. When I went down into the very lowest level, there is a shop there called The Source with all kinds of Egyptian paraphernalia books on the translation of the different hieroglyphics and papyrus that have been found throughout Egypt, on the monuments, in the tombs, on the pyramids, the translations of the different stelae, including the Metternich stele, which the stele group is named after. Next to that is a museum. There's a complete reproduction of Tutankhamun's tomb. Then I began to see these photographs of dancing girls and men in chariots. And these were photographs. These were not paintings or prints. These were photographs. And then I saw double doors above which the words theater was displayed. Again, pinned on my press pass, went through those doors and down in the bowels of this huge, gigantic pyramid was a recreation of the Roman circus. And at night they have huge pageants. The one that's advertised is called the Winds of the Gods. The Winds of the Gods. And at one point, the wall of this huge, tremendous circus in which you could place a football field opens up and they create the Nile River running through this auditorium. Everywhere there are people who will answer your questions and if you take the boat ride on the tour of the Nile you will see recreations of all the great monoliths of Egypt and they will tell you the story of the Osirian cycle of Nut and her children, Isis and Nephthys, Osiris and Set. And at one point you will see the guardian of the secrets of the universe displayed upon the wall. If you don't look up high, you won't see it. The only other place you see it is in the first episode of The Search for the Obelisk. This creature has the exact same facial characteristics and the exact same eyes as the supposedly alien creature on the cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion. I told you, actually years ago, when I first began my lecture tours, and all during these radio broadcasts, that all of these things are tied together. They are linked just as your toe is linked to your head. You may look at your toe and say, that's a toe. It has nothing to do with my head until you try to cut it off, and then you will find very quickly that it has everything to do with your head. You cannot separate the UFO phenomenon or the stories about aliens visiting the Earth from the New World Order or from the mystery religions or from Las Vegas any more than you can separate your toe from your head without understanding at that point that you made a big mistake. In the Luxor you can see all of this come together. It comes together very well. You might want to go out and get the latest issue of Time magazine, the February, or excuse me, the January 10th, 1994 issue of Time magazine. That's the January 10th, 1994 issue of Time magazine on the cover you will see what I'm talking about. Now one of the things that I noticed inside the Luxor Hotel is that this could be the city of the future. People could live, work, eat, sleep, be entertained, be born and die, all within that pyramid. All within that pyramid. Something else was going on, ladies and gentlemen, 
that was insidious in nature. Remember, I told you this is a temple of initiation into the new world religion, the new age religion, into the new, the brave new world, as Aldous Huxley would have called it and did call it in his book. It came a decade late for George Orwell, but nevertheless it is the same. People are herded like cattle through these, through these things that they pay to see. They're treated like stupid sheeple. And something else occurs that was so significant, I looked around me and could not believe that no one there but me understood what was happening. You go down to the lower level to a counter there and you buy your ticket for these things. And everything has to have this ticket. You are told to hold the ticket in your right hand. It has the UPC on the ticket. You're told not to hold it in your left hand. You must hold it in your right hand with the UPC facing outward from your hand. Every time you go into one of these events, one of these rides on the Nile River ride or the three episodes or anything, there's a scanner under which you are told to pass your hand and it reads the UPC code on the ticket. There is an attendant standing there. They will not take your ticket and pass it under the scanner for you. You are to do that. It is a form of indoctrination getting you used to passing your hand under a scanner to get something in return. It is a Pavlovian conditioning. You do it enough, you think nothing of it. And eventually that ticket will disappear and whatever is being scanned will be in your hand. You see, even when you have trouble and you're not holding the ticket right, they tell you to pass it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, try it again. Only when it becomes obvious that people behind are getting very upset with you holding up the line will the attendant take the ticket and pass it under the scanner for you. For this is a form of conditioning and you cannot be conditioned if they do it for you. Everything in the Luxor Hotel is an indication of what is to come. Everything. I went into the casino on this day, forgot to tell you I was filming, filmed everything, wore my press pass and went everywhere. Anywhere I wanted to go, I was treated courteously, people opened doors for me, people offered to set up props for me in the casino, around the center where the obelisk goes up through the ceiling. There are all the reproductions of the beautiful golden mummy cases and the mask, the death masks. I turned around and saw two obelisks on each side of a small stairway and a jackal and then the door in front which looked like a tomb was actually an elevator that goes up one floor into the Isis restaurant. So I went up there, it was too dark to videotape up there but I took still pictures and they will be in the videotape, we will videotape the still pictures. It is one of the most beautiful foyers that I've ever seen with ancient Egyptian art pieces of jewelry and glass cases. On each side of the entryway into the actual restaurant are the huge stone reproductions of Egyptian gods. There are brass, they look like gold, and I, they may be gold-leafed. Snake heads on the ends of all the furniture, cobra. Inside, in a glass case with a beam of light shining directly down on it, is a statue of Isis in all her glory. It is ornate, dripping with wealth and affluence. Everything, dear listeners, is designed to take you out of yourself and surrounded by all of this symbolism, indoctrinate you into the New World Order. And you're so astounded and awed by the beauty of all of this, you fail to see the methods of control and the terrible religion and the God that you will be asked to bow to. Now, I'm a true constitutionalist. If you really wanted to bow to that God, I would fight for your, for your right to do it, whether I proved or not. For I came to understand many years ago that if I deny you the right to practice your religion, you could also deny me the right to practice mine. I have no qualms with people practicing the religion they wish to practice. The problem I have is being lied to and deceived and manipulated into doing things and believing things and accepting the loss of freedoms and sovereignty through deception and lies and cunning wit, for the most part, being enacted upon an unsuspecting, trusting people.
That I despise. And I know that whatever new order or new world they create through these types of procedures will not be the utopia that they promise that it will be, will not be a wonderful world free from crime. No, ladies and gentlemen, it will just be another mountain of lies built upon the last mountain of lies. And someday, somewhere, someone is going to expose the original lie upon which all of this was built, and the whole structure will come tumbling down. I hope that the hour of the time is functioning in some way toward that end. Only you know the answer to that. I am constantly amazed that all of this is flaunted in front of the people. You see, it's all out in the open now for anyone who cares to look. And from our research, we found that it's never really been hidden during this century. Of course, the manipulations are built upon masterful lies. But if you want to do the research and look, you'll, you can always find the truth behind the lie because it's not hidden. The way that they've been able to get away with all of these things is very simply they believe, and in most instances they're right, that most people don't want to think for themselves and will never look. Therefore, they don't even hide anything. That's a shame. It is, in fact, an indictment of all, all of the American people and the people of the world. It's always been my hope to be able to wake the sheeple so that they become real people whom we can then empower to save the penultimate achievement of all of mankind, and that is the document that for the first time in the history of the world truly set man free, gave him the greatest opportunity and created the greatest civilization, the greatest nation that's ever existed upon the face of this earth, and now everyone is willing to flush it down the toilet, literally, and step back into slavery. Why? At night, the Luxor lives up to its name and is truly the source of light. As darkness falls and they turn on the mechanism at the apex of the pyramid, the brightest light I have ever seen in my life, or that anyone on this earth has ever seen besides the sun, shines up through the center of the crystalline capstone, and a pure white beam of light, a shaft of light, reaches up into space, and it is... It is one of only two natural man-made structures that can be seen from space. One is the Great Wall of China, and the other is the Luxor Light. On a clear, clear night, with a dust-free atmosphere, the light can be seen as far away as Los Angeles and Phoenix, Arizona. It is truly awe-inspiring. Photographs of it are awe-inspiring. Never mind being there in person, just looking at a photograph of it will take your breath away as you realize that the light is so strong that on a clear night in clear air with no dust and no smog and no smoke, you can still see the beam of light as if it's a column, a translucent column reaching far out into space. Good night and God bless you all.